welcome everybody to Studio Talks, Studio Visits, uh, a series of talks that um, is sponsored by the Bill Lane Center for the American West at Stanford University. I'm Lucas Feltzman and I'm very pleased and honored today to be with Linda Connor. Hi, Linda. Hi, Lucas. So I'm going to play a little video of Linda's house. And the idea of these talks is to be in and um, be with a be with an artist. So let's see. So they're invited. They're invited. All right. So uh, just briefly, also the Bill Lane Center for the American West is a really amazing um, center that, in uh, the in the words of Bruce Cain, has always. Uh, the Bill Lane Center strives to keep a finger on the pulse of Western governance and policy issues while highlighting significant environmental concerns and elevating the region's rich arts and culture. And so if, you don't, if you're not familiar with them, please look them up. There's a wonderful website, there's seminars, there's research, there is talks, there's writers that present and so on. So, Today, as I already said, we are, we are live and live in studio uh, visits. Linda Connor is an amazing artist who was born in 1944 in New York. You had to tell them that? Well, sure. next year is going to be a very big one if you do a quick calculation <laughs> so that will get you close to yeah. where we are. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm not going to make this too long and ra rattle up all of Linda's great accomplishments, but I just want to say that um, she has been in over 40 sol solo show. She has received two NEA grants and the Guggenheim Fellowship, and she has published many books, some of which we're going to look through. And uh, m really an important part is also that she has taught at the San Francisco Art Institute for f over 40 years. 50. Over 50, 50, over 50 years, yeah. and she has been a founding member of Photo Alliance mm -hmm. and is just a wonderful, creative, crazy force of life. And I want to interrupt a little bit, okay? because uh, it's my nature, but Lucas was one of my students. Yes. And um, he was doing, he did a very good job, even as a student. Yes. Is that true? Oh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, you, you did. Yeah, I think I passed you. Do you want to show, you, you wanted to show um, a book to start with? Yeah. It's Can we see right Linda for a second? I mean, we're, we're right outside my library, which is in the other room. And if any of you are book fiends as I am, it, it just can take over an entire environment. Um, but I think photographers really love books. Um, and the first book, I, I went to Rhode Island School of Design um, to study with Harry Callahan. But the first year they have a program where you didn't get to have your major. So I, the, one of the, the classes was in um, um, uh, script and um, writing by hand. So I did this book where I, I included uh, tree pictures. And most of them are, I mean, even that one's out of focus. Um, this was before I had my first uh, photo class at RISD. But the picture that I t took during that time, right before I went to RISD, so I was a senior in high school, was this picture. and. I was looking at it recently and realized that I'm still sort of making pictures that have this kind of structure and complexity. And it's kind of fun to realize that what you did then is still pertinent. It's a full circle. Yeah. So let's start with this uh, slideshow. So here you are. <laughs> I yeah. think that was before you made that book. A oh, bit. yes, it was. <laughs> this is when I went my first year at camp when I was about seven years old. 
And this was a uh, cabin mate of mine. This is up in Maine. And we both had little brownie cameras. And we thought it was really cool to take simultaneous pictures of each other. Great. But I never did see her, the other half of the yes. concept. Um, then we're moving a ahead and really. uh, just you have a beautiful old lens here and yeah. can you tell us a little bit about that? It's something that well, was given to you? Yes, my I had a great aunt Ethelin who was my aunt's aunt and she had studied with Clarence White in New York in 1915 and the camera she got at that time was an 8x10 century view camera with this soft focus uh, lens and you can see I dropped it. it. It fell off the camera one time and it hit some rocks, but it didn't break. And one thing that's interesting too is that this lens doesn't have a shutter. And in, in our time, we don't even think about that. Yeah. But uh, of course, every small camera that you have has a shutter. Every view camera has a shutter in the lens, but this lens has no shutter. So how do you expose? How do you determine well, you, the you, amount of light? You, you get, I always guessed. And I sh because I like the, if you're going to shoot fuzzy pictures, they might as well be pretty fuzzy and not almost sharp. Okay. So it has a slot in the lens where you could put in these metal plates with different size apertures. But I just decided I'd shoot everything wide open. Okay. And the way you make an exposure, and, and th this is a picture of imaging Cunningham, that I did a, a portrait with this lens, and this was very much like the camera she used when she started her career. Okay. And she showed me how you can get the, I don't know if I can do it here with just holding these things. But Open you, and close like that. Yeah, you ah, just, with a right. wrist, real quick right. wrist. Wrist action. Yes. Okay. And of course, everything's upside down and very glowy and um, you know, the, the lens didn't know where to focus a highlight, so sometimes they even get a little aura around things. Yeah. So anyway, I, I sort of fell in love with this camera, and the, the, after the tree book, the next book I did was um, my first monograph called Solos. We have it here, too. Okay. So I'm going to go through these pictures. Uh, at a good pace because okay. we have a lot of work to see. Mm -hmm. But this is really a portrait lens and there are some like almost portraits in here like the one that we see right now. But mostly you started using it in a very different yeah. way. It was not meant to be uh, used this way. No. I, we don't know. No, there were some people doing landscapes and other, other things, mm -hmm. yeah. But um, I certainly wasn't. No, a portraiture was not what I was interested in at that point. But I did really, I was attracted to the, um, the sort of mystery that the uh, limited depth of field created. And, you know, the, the romanticism, the, the, the mystery to a certain extent. And I started doing quite a bit of travel for my photography at that point. That's another aspect of my life. I tend not to get much done when I'm, oh, we could almost go in the hallway and see that painting that I uh, now that own. That photographed. Yeah. And it's an amazing, this little square of light is in a way what makes the image. And it appears that really bright light is really what it, what created something very special in that, mm -hmm. in that visual field. And also that was a uh, painting that was on the wall and I took it off and put it on the couch so the trout looks like it's really leaping. <laughs> anyway. Um, so not only is this a very big lens, it's also a very big camera. Uh, I think you mentioned it briefly, but it's an 8 by 10 inch view camera. So. Yeah. Uh, 
the negative plate that it's inserted is 8 by 10 inches in analog photography just like in digital photography as bigger as your recording surface is mm -hmm. uh, that will be the uh, on the back of the camera the sensor in the digital camera the plate or the piece of mm -hmm. film as more information you record and some more detail so 8 by 10 is a gigantic camera mm -hmm. And but at least I didn't have to use glass plates, which I think was the original um, technique when that camera was made. Yes. If you think of Timothy Sullivan or somebody like that, not only did they have to carry the 8 by 10 camera up there, they had to carry the glass plates and sometimes coat them in a dark tent before exposure. You see, if I had to do all that chemistry, I wouldn't have... No. And one of the other things, you know, I, I, for, for quite a long time, I had a really hard time trying to remember that the smallest aperture gave you the most um, sharpness, the most depth of field. I couldn't figure that out. The numbers got, it went in the wrong direction. They got bigger or smaller. You see, even now I get mixed up with it. So um, I shot everything wide open. You simply removed the aperture. Yeah. Yeah, you didn't need it. Yeah. And so everything is, you know, limited depth of field. And um, yeah. So would you have ideas of subject matters or was it kind of exploring through looking? Oh, you, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you would go see and, yeah. and see what happens yeah. in that, uh, on that glass plate mm -hmm. as the image is projected. But I could see something that I, well, usually I, if I was out with my camera, I usually had my camera eyes in. Yes. This was a funny one. This was a, a restaurant. Um, they had a porch and they had built this out of the food cans that the big food cans that the kitchen used, they had made this pyramid. And um, yeah, this was down in Mexico and they were these um, glass doors with etch, etch glass doors in the cathedral there. This is in the Yucatan. So you grew up in Connecticut, or you were born in Connecticut? I was born in, Man in New York City, New York but City. we moved out to Connecticut when I was maybe three or four, or something like that. And then you moved to the West Coast? No. No, I went to Rodin School of Design. And then when I finished up there, I asked Harry Callahan what I should do next. And he just said, go to Chicago and study with Aaron. So I went and studied with Aaron Siskin for two years and got my uh, master's degree, and then c came out to um, San Francisco. Thankfully, um, back in Chicago, I lived near campus and had a car. And so a visiting artist came. I was usually the one to volunteer to pick them up and get them around where they needed to go. And Imogen Cunningham had come out uh, with Aaron's um, invitation. And so I got to drive her around for a few days, and she was such a kick. Oh, wonderful. She was so feisty. And um, I said, I really, this was my second year, the last spring there, and I really wanted to get out of Chicago. And the idea of moving back east was not appealing. Moving to New York was terrifying. Um, but somehow the idea of Seattle and San Francisco that I didn't know seemed like a better bet, and um, she encouraged me to um, come visit her in San Francisco, and she gave me a couple of names. Um, one was Jerry Bouchard, who was head of the photo department at the Art Institute, and I showed him my portfolio, and um, I also had a Black Hathaway patch at that time because I had an eye infection, That another story. And my hair was about out to here, and um, he remembered, I was memorable yeah. as an applicant. Yeah. So um, I, it wasn't like he said, 
we want you to teach here or something. A few uh, months or two later, when I was really getting desperate, I got a call from him, and he said, well, a standby beginning class had opened up. And so that's how I got my first class at the Art Institute, which was a wonderful place for me to land. Wonderful. Yeah. So now something changed. We see a very different looking image. It is more like sharp as we think of mm -hmm. photographic images. I think I had a lens board that would fit that camera that I put some, I started shifting over to sharp. And also, um, I had, I don't know if the book was totally published at that time, but I knew I was doing the book. And that brought a closure sort of to it. And something new. Yeah. Because now the kind of magic that the lens created is gone in a way. I mean, it's still here. It's just a different kind of magic. But Yeah, the, you had you to have the that? real deal. I mean, it was, What's the real deal? The subject matter has to be sort of magical or special yes. or extremely elegant and refined in some yeah. way. And I was lucky about when the book came out was when I got my Guggenheim and was able to take six months off from school. And I went to Asia for the first time for five months. I can't believe I did that. Anyway. Um, and that was pretty extraordinary because of the, the age and the cultural richness of the cultures there mm -hmm. and to a certain extent the exoticness of it for mm -hmm. me. Um, but I was also very interested in the relationship of um, the cultural spiritual nature of those cultures and how it related to nature. Mm -hmm. And during that period, I was also sort of discovered um, rock art, ancient rock art. This picture that we're looking at now was done in Hawaii on lava, on an old lava flow. Do we call these petroglyphs too, as, as the ones in the American West? Mm -hmm. So As opposed to pictographs, which are painted. Right. Yeah. And so here you are in Hawaii. Yeah. This looks pretty rough. You yeah, got a mask was, on. Yeah, that was the day, and very heavy shoes. That was the day after a lava flow. It was just, it, it, in the, cr the cracks, it was still glowing. So sometimes you f photograph in these maybe extreme places, but sometimes you're also surrounded by people that's probably not the norm that we have like a group no. of people staring at something that you're photographing as well right and that is a picture that i made off of that bridge that is in the um another book i did i think we'll see it a little later on i'll point it out but so you really made a very extensive um series of photographs about petroglyphs and I just picked out this mm -hmm. one with the hand because it's so beautiful and horrible also it has a bullet hole in the hand so it shows uh, Which most people size. don't even really realize yeah. um, you really have to inspect it or even for me to mention it it's not in the title mm -hmm. but um, yeah it was very poignant to not only see that sort of one individual marking that, that place, um, but then to think of some other coming along with a gun and using it as target practice. And marking it again. And then you come along as well and you mark it again through your process. So you're looking through your camera at something ancient that somebody has painted, chiseled their mark and you kind of rework it into a mm -hmm. contemporary... Well, this wasn't ch chiseled. This was... Th this, well, what they... This is a very common... You see this in Australia also, in the rock art there. It's a... They put their hand up and then they have a, like a white paint or a clay mm -hmm. surface. And they spit or blow it 
-hmm. around. They use the hand as a stencil. Yeah. So it's a real human Imprint. presence. Yeah, yeah. A little later, or almost concurrently, you also started working at the Lick Observatory. Well, that was later. That okay. wasn't until the How did that come about? Mid-90s. Oh, well, this goes back to that first interview with Jerry Bouchard. He mentioned, uh, because I had done some collage things with um, old glass plates that I'd found in an uh, antique store, and he mentioned that he had once worked at the Lick Observatory in the summer printing glass plates of stars and that they had really big plates like 20 by 24 and I just that just stayed in my mind and years in the mid 90s printing out paper which we haven't really talked about yet but was the method of printing that I'd used all the way through from the soft focus time um, because having an 8x10 larger was kind of, I eventually got one, but it would, um, when you can just put the okay. negative and next to this sun printing paper, put it in a little frame and pop it out in the garden or on the deck, and then you can see the image in a few minutes or a few hours, depending how dense the negative was, and um, toned, and you've got a very beautiful print. So for some people who might not be so familiar, you have an 8x10, Linda still uses an 8x10 camera uh, as before with, with the soft focus work. So she has an 8x10 negative and that negative gets contact printed onto a piece of what she calls printing out paper. It's also called studio proof for a while. It's mm -hmm. an albumin type of paper. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very slow, so slow that you didn't have to expose it in the darkroom, you could take it out and quickly put in a pressure print frame and then expose it in the sunlight. Yeah, direct sun. Direct sun. It needed direct sun. And so this now comes in at the lick as a, a wonderful way or maybe the only way of working because those glass plates that were taken up there cannot leave. Right. The well, there I guess there are some small ones that are about five by seven, but most most of them were eight by ten. But some of the eclipse plates that I was able to use um, are twenty two by twenty eight or something. I mean, very big glass plates, amazing. And they they uh, they weren't afraid with you. Well, by then I I didn't do that the first few times. Yes. Yeah, I sort of the, our the trust grew mm -hmm. um, with time. Also, you know, I could just prop them up in the sunlight directly outside the door of the archive. So it wasn't like I was packing them up or moving them anywhere. And then I'd expose my prints there and then bring them home for toning and, and fixing. Mm -hmm. So uh, during this time, there's other people who worked with what we call appropriation, uh, using source imagery that might not have come out of your own production. And, you know, Thomas Struth would be one that comes to mind who worked with, he did an image, he did a series of star images. I believe he probably kind of just purchased an archive of, of star mm -hmm. negatives somewhere right. online and then printed them. Whereas you make this arduous trip to the Lick Observatory. Pretty and nice drive, it's actually. It's really an amazing, uh, very remote road. And then you're up there with your print frames, finding glass negatives and printing them in the sun and bringing them back. Mm -hmm. um, and then once, I had, once yeah. I had the back, then um, like the idea of just doing an exhibition or a book of just them didn't appeal to me. I wanted to um, uh, introduce them with my other work. And also there was one box, thank goodness they never threw anything out, but that said broken plates on it. And there were glass plates that were shattered in one way or another, and they were interleaved. So the, you had all the pieces 
that you could patch, uh, you know, jigsaw back together in the print frame. Mm -hmm. And so those became some of my favorite um, works from from that body of work. Yeah. Uh, this one appears to be a negative. It is. Occasionally they would um, want to do two versions, a negative and a positive. And they would take the plate and contact print it with another plate. Mm -hmm. And um, so this one you can see in this image, some of the emulsion on the first plate had peeled, peeled off. off. Yeah. Yeah. But that made it more, I don't know, um, I don't think I would, I have some other ones that are just sort of cleaner and more scientific, but I love that. So they, the, the astronomers, to see the image would have to contact print it onto another glass plate. No, only if they wanted to see it in the, in the, the negative, negative or positive. Yeah, oh, because most, they... this didn't happen that, that often. Yeah. They would just make paper prints actually, okay. probably on the same type of printing out paper mm -hmm. that I was using, you know, a hundred years later. Yes. So as you just said, you started integrating uh, these images with some of your other work and your other work has, is now really expanding all over the world. Where, where did you go after that? Um, well, a number of places. I've been to Guatemala, Haiti, um, Peru, Bali, Thailand, Japan. This is in Cambodia. That last one was in Kashmir. Um, oh, where was this? The Cambodia. And you're still traveling with your 8 by 10 camera yeah. with plates, with a heavy no, tripod? No, 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 not with well, plates. Well, plates, I mean 8 by 10 film in film holders. Yeah. A tripod, a dark cloth. So, uh, yeah, everything that's in, um, we're looking at the work in Odyssey now. All of that work was 8 by 10. So how is it as a woman to travel with all this equipment and go to these foreign countries and I mean that must be um, difficult. I, you don't strike me as the like explorer woman with boots and... So no, but I'm, I'm stubborn. You're stubborn. Tell us about that. Well, well I've also had my all my view camera equipment stolen in Thailand oh. by an airport no, no. people who didn't put it on my flight. So, um, yeah, that was... And here, just want to point out one of your beautiful images that obviously now also plays off the stars and the trails and the light and the celestial bodies that is, not, is also present in your work and that gets now connected with the plates mm -hmm. and um, throughout your other journeys. And also just that things are in black and white, I think. Um, or with the slight, with the brownish tone of the printing out paper mm -hmm. that we tried to match in the book. Um, that, I don't know, brings, the correlates with the, the lick material, I think. And also, I'm not photographing, you know, all these pictures were made since the mid 70s till a few years ago. Um, but they, um, what was I going to say? There, I've never photographed a gas station. I don't think there's a vehicle in any, uh, maybe a horse <laughs> in any of my pictures. Um, they're all contemporary, but they they isolate the subject. And I'm particularly interested in maybe the timeless mm -hmm. or something that, and I'm probably enough of a romantic to find things that are older, more to my liking, and I think you can maybe enter them with your imagination a little bit more. And you also started connecting with people in these travels. Like, of course, yeah. I mean, there is yeah. there are people in the earlier work too, but uh, it seems like another mm 
connection. Do you think men photograph different in the landscape from women? Oh, come on. You know I do. How so? <laughs> oh, people. Yes. Well, okay. I think um, men have a tendency to photograph sp space and women have a tendency to photograph place. So um, m men like high vantage points and large expanse of views. Overviews. Overviews. Territory. Mm -hmm. And women, I think, mostly photograph um, where they have some knowledge or experience or a home or a or a place that's occupied or used um, or familiar. Now, I do do a lot of traveling, and now my work currently is much more abstract in the landscape. Um, I don't think it, uh, you know, what I'm saying is are big generalizations. Yeah, yeah. But from looking at the history of landscape photography, mm -hmm. so to speak, you can see how there's a... And even the word landscape, mm -hmm. just that expression calls for... That's why you have landscape uh, history of uh, photographic landscapes and, you know, there'll be 40 guys in the book and two or three women have photographs in, in the same collection. But if you were to photograph home places and gardens and um, I don't know, a, allowed some more human activity in the picture, then you would find many more women in those collections. How did all these travels and this immense body of work that you created, and it really is, is tremendous when one starts looking at your archive, how did that um, work with the teaching schedule and oh, the community of quite, teaching? Uh, quite well, because um, if you're teaching in a college, you have about, I don't know, four months off a year, mm -hmm. and that you know, particularly in the summer, that gave you quite a wonderful uh, period of time to be able to go. That one was, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, that was in uh, the, f the first or second time I went to Nepal, either in 79, I think it was in 79 or 80, I went back the next year. But there was... I had the big camera and I was out there and so I, the crowd is sort of gathering watching me take a picture of this bull that was holding very, very still. I mean, it was just <laughs> like he was planted in the middle of the road. And then this French tourist, this woman with her 35, saw me taking a picture of it. And so she starts dancing up right in front of the bull with her little camera. I wanted to ask her. Anyway. But we remember. So in this book also there's images on the left on the right side and there is a much stronger sense of sequencing yeah. that starts coming into your work. How anything you want to say about how that thoughts about how you use that in your work? Is that an important force to I connect so. the images? Yeah and when I um but you don't have it in the order of the book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't, it's a little. This uh, is, by the way, the image from the. The bridge. From yeah. the bridge where yeah. we saw you in with Hawaii. The camera. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of amazing because it seems like you are just, I don't know where you are. You're, you are like, you know, it seems remote, it seems in another sphere. And then knowing that you're standing somewhere with a bunch of tourists is really yep. amazing. How and they're taking the it? same picture. They're taking the same picture, but it won't look the same. <laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> so, 
So, but also teaching what I maybe want to touch upon a little bit. Um, one thing that I really treasured about you that is different uh, as a teacher is that you not only taught, but you also built some lasting community. And I'm thinking back of even when I was a student, I would come to this house here and hang out and you'd be gone and well, I'd be here with a bunch of students and we'd jump into your hot tub. And, you, know, you did? We did. <laughs> oh, yes. Ah. And we'd be cooking and cleaning and <laughs> good to know. So, I mean, one thing that's just amazing is that you, the, the teaching and um, the art, the photography became your life in that you created a family around you that, you know, you really treasured and I treasure you and, you know, keeps on going. And that's a really uh, special thing as well. I say it is too. Yeah. yeah. Um, why is that? Well, I was going to say, we could come back to that, but um, I was also going to say one of the things that I adored about teaching was that um, I couldn't figure out how to teach when I began without showing pictures. So I used to bring in my books until they started falling apart mm -hmm. the first year or two. And then I started making slides. Yes. And I, I don't know how many thousands of slides I have of, of other pictures by other artists um, that I would other photographers that I'd show in class and and talk about ideas and at, I can't even remember when it started but I started teaching a class called the sacred and profane mm -hmm. that um, we the class lasted ideally a full year both semesters and you had to sort of have a portfolio to get into the class because you had to be at least partly along on some kind of technique and vision. Um, but it really gave us a time to know each other and, you know, be comfortable with critiquing each other's work. And I got to show you a, a year's worth of, of weird and wonderful slides mm -hmm. on various topics that I would put together mm -hmm. that weren't just the history of photography, but used photography, you know, like nocturnal photography, or uh, I had a thing of photography and death, and, you know, the gender issues in, in the landscape, and, you know, so it was fun. And, um, oh, my Vanitas lecture, that was probably one of the best. See, I threw you off. <laughs> well, we can get back to the community. I was wondering if also maybe uh, you were adopted as a child yeah. and you lived by yourself yeah. most of the time, mm -hmm. maybe, mm -hmm. um, that that is a, you know, a reason for building this, this family around you. Uh, I wouldn't say the adoption part has to do yeah. with that because I had... Uh, younger brothers and you know yeah, family, lots of cousins yeah, yeah. and yes. yeah all of that um, yeah I um, photography has become um, a, a, a network of friends and um, shared involvement and this is a great area although I have, have friends in other cities and stuff, other parts of the country, but the Bay Area is a very congenial one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not as, uh, I think of New York as being sort of cutthroat a little bit. Yeah. Um, looking at this image, I noticed something, which is that the notches of the negative holder are, are on the left. Uh, do you load? Do you load your pictures from the right? I don't know, but it, I, I did have... No. Are you left-handed? No, I'm not left-handed. <laughs> Would you like to be left-handed? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I think it goes in the bottom left corner. Uh -huh. I, I, sometimes yeah. I... This is, it switches, I'm it? dyslexic, 
And so all this left-right business is never, these number things have never been easy. So I sometimes have to sacrifice a, a piece of film mm -hmm. just to look where the notches are to be able to know which way to put it in. Um, one thing maybe that's interesting to uh, mention too is that when you travel with a big view camera, uh, we talked about the, the film and the tripod and the camera and all that, but you have to load, reload the film. Mm -hmm. So you have to create a pocket of darkness, a little dark room somewhere. Well, How do you do that? No, it's a changing bag. A changing bag. Yeah, so I sit down on the ground and I put my hands in and do that. And, and, and everybody thinks, whoa. What is she doing? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, in fact, they would just go back one picture. You know, the, the other thing is just me as a sort of phenomenon walking around with the, this big camera and a cape and, you know, some people have never seen that before. I remember kids in Kathmandu following me and asking if it was a television because <laughs> they could see something happening yes. on the ground glass. Yes. It was, it was. Well, this whole process is very physical. You have to load film, you have to carry the camera, you have to contact, print the images. But I don't, I don't develop the film there. No, I don't contact, I yes. do that all yeah, home. You bring the film home, develop it, and then make a contact print. And all these are still printed by the sun mm -hmm. as we were talking During this earlier. period. Yeah. Not an easy process, but I surmise you're not interested in easy. It's, no, it was a very easy process. It's easy. Yeah. Because it's logical and there's, uh, why is it easy? Yeah. Well, if the film's developed, yeah. And I used to trade develop, yeah. you know, and you just have it in this sauce for a while and then... Oh, you think in cooking terms? Sometimes. Okay. <laughs> and then you put it in the fixer and then you wash it. Yeah. Okay, then you dry it, you hang it up with clothespins. And then the printing process, you have your glass frame with a hinge back. You put in the negative, you slap this paper, which you can open in room light, and then you stick it out in bright sun, and you open up the back, and you, you see if it's done. Mm -hmm. It's like cook. It really is like mm -hmm. you don't want to burn the cookies, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when it gets dark enough, and you know, there's a little bit of bleaching back in the toner. So you, anyway, but you learn to bake the prints. Then they can sit in a box for weeks until you decide to have a night of toning. And the toning you can do with your lights on in the dark room. Yes. And I had a little TV in my dark room. I don't have a, I guess a VCR thing. Uh, and so I could read the New Yorker and rock my trays or, or watch something. And the toning was done with gold toner, yes. which makes the prints very, very permanent and very long lasting. Cause it yes, and it. also a beautiful sort yeah, of rich, warm, yeah. warm brown. Beautiful color comes from. So now you have this tremendous archive of thousands, I wanna say maybe hundred thousands of prints uh, lots. Lots of prints. What would you, and this is something that is, I think, an issue for a lot of photographers that make, make objects, make mm -hmm. prints. Sometimes the photographers now, their whole output is on, on, on the web, so it's kind of an immaterial, but what you make is actual things. What, what do you hope to happen to that archive, or how should it be, um, I mean, it will outlast all of us by, you know, lots of time, so. You know, hell and high water doesn't come, but yeah. Um, I would like to see it go to a number of places. 
like mm -hmm. being distributed to a couple of places. Yeah. Uh -huh. well, maybe more than a couple. Maybe more. Than I mean, a couple. especially for multiple prints and stuff like that. Yeah. And um, although, yeah, the archiving, I'm just not very. Um, you know, being precise and keeping track of everything is not... You just make. Strong. You make and make. It appears, looking at your house, that you're just a passionate collector. collector. That's true. Right. So the making of prints is also kind of a collecting of more and more prints of different subject matters and beauty. Yeah, but there's, so you know, quite a bit that I don't print. Uh, particularly now that stuff has to be well no I'll take I'll take that back um, I was going to say now that it, things are digital I don't print everything but um, let me give me a second here you you tell them something and I'll be right back Linda is leaving us yeah, with a room. figure <laughs> a figure sitting in the shadow of the pyramids in Egypt and it's, yeah, just maybe illustrating a little bit something she talked earlier about that she didn't, for in this photograph, we don't see the pyramids, we don't see the monument, we don't see the marking, we see the kind of uh, intimateness of resting in the shadow. And then here, I think we are in Turkey here. Yeah, Mount Nemert. Can you talk uh, real briefly, we passed it, I'm just briefly going to go back. So there's this image and there's this image before. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, this is a good story. This is in a caravansary, a very old one, in Turkey. And a very tall building where they used to let the camels rest for caravans. And they had these domes um, that probably let in some light or s something. Well, anyway, this was a single dome that had collapsed. And so it was just this circle with this beautiful architecture around it um, that and this is probably 20 feet high yeah. at least it's it's really very high and birds were flying in and out of it, it was quite well. so I took a picture of it and then um, I don't know if it was that same night it occurred to me I wanted to do star trails in it so my guide and a travel companion and I got to sleep on carpets because there was a little shop as part of this thing of carpet salesmen all over Turkey. But it began to rain a little mm -hmm. bit and it got overcast. And so I got a picture for a few hours worth, but it wasn't very good. And it took me 14 years before I was back in Turkey again got my guide and we got permission to be in there at, on a really nice clear night and did the second this picture. picture. Wonderful. So now when I come back, particularly since I've been uh, photographing um, four by five, because there's a certain point I just, when I couldn't, when they stopped making printing out paper and that beautiful process was gone um, and I had to switch to digital. But so when I come back with film now, what I have, what I um, make is we scan the negatives, whether they're eight by 10 or, or now four by five and we make these, grids of smaller prints of pretty much anything that's not a terrible picture. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so this is my editing process now. Right. And so. Um, so now here we actually um, are in the Himalayas again mm -hmm. and this leads us to some of these very recent pictures, yeah. or not so recent, because you say you've already worked on this, 16 years. This yeah. body of, what is this body called that we're going to see? Uh, once the ocean floor. And here you are again under the dark cloth yeah. photographing.
being under the dark cloth also is this kind of you you see this luminous plate with the image on it but you also hiding everything around you it's like you're creating your own private space mm -hmm. and uh, and that experience is i think very much part of the process and part of what comes out of it too is this kind of loneliness in the darkness of of the camera and the plate you're very romantic i am a i am romantic <laughs> when i was in school yes. you know back then. you tried to be tougher then exactly because it wasn't very cool to be romantic mm -hmm. but i think and i i studied with you know and i'm not saying larry sultan said that but Larry Sultan was a little bit of a more analytical pole mm -hmm. where you were the more intuitive and uh, would maybe let me allow to let that romanticism come out a little bit. So once was the ocean once, floor. Once the ocean, once the ocean floor, the Himalayas were under a sea. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I hope this is true, but I, I think I heard somewhere that on top of Mount Everest, there's petrified trilobite shit. That's crazy. Isn't that wonderful? That's wonderful <laughs> and unbelievable in a way, right? Yeah. And tells us what, what little <laughs> things we are in the history of. Oh, no kidding. So I've been photographing in the Himalayas, and, um, and this is a project that I'm continuing with, and I just this past summer went to Nepal to um, because almost all of these are done in northern India in an area called Ladakh and I thought Nepal would be even more like this but it turns out the area that I was in was it must have been a sandstone or mudstone kind of region of the Himalayas because the rocks were not as fractured and as uh, hard. They eroded very differently and very interestingly. So um, that will be part of this project as well. So w let's go back to the one, the first one, no. Yeah, this one. Is that the one I... Yeah. Um, I photographed this along the Zanskar River because the they were blasting a road um, because of these sheer cliffs. And so the blasting had um, made these fractures in, in very interesting ways. Mm -hmm. They were... Um, they broke according to the type rock and what kind of fissures and things it had in it and also because of the dynamite or whatever. And I had one picture that I did in uh, 2007, I think, that was about my favorite. And, you know, galleries like you to limit your work and to put numbers on it, additions, can't stand doing that. I can't keep it organized. And so I thought, I was back in Ladakh, I've been many times, and I decided, oh, I'll just go back to the rock and I'll do a variation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah I'll just, there you, there yeah. you have your addition. So I'm looking for this thing and it's not there. Oh no, they blasted it away. They blasted uh -oh. further. So. so some of it is, we see some of these cross-sections because of building and blasting. Mm -hmm. um, but it also amuses me because if you look on the wall over here, I don't know if you can... I have four wonderful pictures by Aaron Siskin of stone walls yes. that he did in the 1950s. And, um, you know, I... I, I and I now think, oh my God, Aaron, I'm finally getting abstract. You have a very special relationship with rocks. <laughs> it seems that way. <laughs> I mean, look at this one. This is just amazing. Well, they don't give you any trouble either. Uh -huh. Well, sometimes they do. Sometimes they're... 
So and here are just a couple examples of how some of the things might be paired in a book. And or, in, or on the wall. Or on the wall, mm -hmm. yes. This relationship between images, things that are not the same, but they, they, have, they appear similar in it, their visual structure. Mm -hmm. You've also worked with books and uh, collage, collage yeah. which is another, you know, brings me back to that thing we said about appropriation. You, you used appropriation, you used collage. But I don't yeah. use that word. You don't use that word, you just, exactly, I mean, that's a little bit the point, you just do it intuitively, right? Where some artists kind of like use this as this. Um, well, this is a very early one. This is like in, nine, this is right when I first came to San Francisco. Um, and I think before I got the, the soft focus camera. And the Science Museum in Golden Gate Park had a wonderful shop where they had all these shells and natural things and shark's teeth and all fun things that you could buy. And I, of course, had the Edward Weston book, and I wanted to look at my uh, chambered nautilus next to his, and it there it was. There it you was. Know? Yes. It's a great continuation of a uh, visual tradition. And then, um, you know, some of the things I collect are um, beautiful. Um, this is a, a, a Native American bowl, um, but I have, I, I. You collect I, a lot. I collect a lot and I display things. Mm -hmm. And there is this little dead snake and um, that's, now that's another ball that's up on the wall. We can't see right now, but that that one has um, a. It's called grasping at straws, and it was a little tendril that had grabbed on to a stalk of straw mm -hmm. or grass that I saw by the side of the road one time, and um, it. It sort of was a metaphor of something I was going through at that time. And so I brought it home and put it in that bowl. And I love the picture. And You don't have to go very far sometimes for an image. That's right. So that brings us to the end of this beautiful series of images. And I want to see if we have some questions for you from people. Okay. Joni Sternbach asks, what brass lens were you using? The, the soft focus? Yeah, does it say it has a it's name? A, yes, it has a name. It's etched. Semi-anchromatic. And it's a P and S. I think it was Pinkham and Smith. Mm -hmm. Was the, so. Uh, English. Maybe, or maybe American. Well, it came from an aunt of yours. Yeah. And, well, but she might have ordered it from somewhere as well. Well, she was studying with Clarence White in New York, so, okay. so um, you know. Yeah. Nadine Levine asked, who are the three photographers that were the most important influences? If you can say. I always say there wasn't. <laughs> I, say I might do that. It's, it's the continue. It's all of them together. And I also, I don't want to answer for you, but I am, I guess, mm -hmm. right now. But knowing your incredible breadth of investigation of different artists, and that doesn't stop with photography, I would think that it is, um, you know, this this whole family of mm -hmm. artists. But well, I can. Well, one person I would put because I remember when I didn't get the work at all was Eugene Ache. Mm -hmm. And when I finally saw, began to see the way he made pictures, they were, um, they were really impressive for me. Yeah. And they take some time. They, they don't jump at you right away. They're not very loud, right? Yeah. yeah. And he said, you know, he's not making art. He's just making records. Mm -hmm. But he did it so exquisitely. Mm -hmm. um, so he would be 
be one for sure. Yeah, I think he is a, um, an artist that has influenced so many other artists um, that um, it's really amazing and holds up and you can go look at it again and again. Sometimes I have had students who ask me, what is a good photograph? What makes a good photograph? And that's a really difficult question to answer and people have different ideas of what that is. But one answer I think that, that really works uh, that I came to after thinking about it is like a good photograph is a photograph you can look at again and again. You can go back to over time and it still gives you something, takes you somewhere, is interesting and Edge's work for sure does that. Mm -hmm. uh, Frederick Summer would be another one. Yes. Um, what about like um, Walker Evans and... Oh, I had a Walker Evans period. In fact, I yeah, thought he was, he was the pinnacle. Yeah. And, and when I, I used to make a, you know, the answer, like who, who most influenced you? Okay, you, you want an answer. But it, and for years, as I mentioned, it was Walker Evans. But if I had really done a chart and had me in the middle, and then Walker Evans would have been up here and real bright. But Julia Margaret Cameron would have been there. Harry Callahan would have been there. Emmett Gowan was absolutely there. Um, so you would suddenly get a much more complicated thing that didn't scream documentary photography. Yeah. Yeah. But it would probably lead you to view camera. Yes, or the really or, or, or the approach, kind of yeah process yeah certainly not color and and you know abstraction right. per se Tom Sempre asks hi Tom what have you not photographed <laughs> that you wish you could <laughs> the moon the moon why well, you have pictures of the moon I do but I had to steal them. Well, no, but there's images of the moon, uh, the moon in some of your images. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're stolen. What do you oh, mean oh, stolen? no, the moon. The moon. I just don't mean the moon sitting up in the landscape. I'm talking about the landscape of the moon. Oh, going there. You want to go to the moon? Yeah. Well, I probably won't. But <laughs> yes, those black skies and all that sunlight. Oh, what a combination. Yes. Maybe a little difficult with a view camera. Yeah. The landing and all. But that was a snarky answer, Tom. Let's see. Um, I don't know. I'm I'm happy to go back to some places actually. Uh, Megan Rippenhoff. Hi, Megan. Says hi, Linda. I had the good fortune to study with you at SFI, San Francisco Art Institute, and learned all kinds of fantastic stuff. <laughs> You have such a wealth of knowledge, and I think all the artists out there will benefit from your advice. What wisdom would you offer to artists, especially young artists? Thank you. Well, I think you have to sort of balance your talents and, and your your obsessions and what really grabs you. Like if at one point in my life I would have, my desire was to be a musician and I have no musical, innate musical talent and I couldn't learn to read music. So it was a really a dead end. But the visual stuff always compensated and came much more easily. Not super easily, but... Um, and then photography seemed to be a v much more democratic than being able to be a painter, which was sort of my idea of an artist when I was in high school. That you have to paint. Yeah. But you have an ability to listen, and it appears that looking at your a library of music that your knowledge and taste is very very wide and maybe music is just as important of an influence as some the visual artists 
maybe not as important, but it's another. It's yeah, it's something I love. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Peck Herring, Herringen says, "Do you see any utility or affinity for your images and the current climate change activists?" I was in a class with you and Bill Burke back in the day. Boy, wow. Hi. <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you something that I am just recently learned about, and I haven't really made the move yet. But in just north of here is Point Reyes uh, National Seashore. And there's a group there called Dark Skies Marin or something like that that is trying to to get the area to uh, control its night uh, lighting and light pollution so that you could actually see the Milky Way. Um, and I'm playing with the idea, now that I'm announcing it, I guess, uh, to the public, I better do it, um, getting in touch with those and offering to make us uh, uh, an addition of a one of the really phenomenal lick plates that were done by E.E. E. Barnard in the late 1800s, 1895. Mm. You know, and he'd have to, I mean, they're two hour exposures and he had to have a guide star and his big, big chunky box camera with the eight by 10 glass plate is strapped, literally banded onto one of the telescopes. Mm -hmm. And for the two or three hours that those pictures took to expose, he has to just, just by in, increment and increment, follow a guide star mm. for that whole exposure. Do hold still. Yeah. So I was thinking maybe they could use um, a really nice digital print of one of those amazing uh, images where the skies were really clear. Talking about exposures, how do you determine your exposure? I don't think I've ever seen you with a line meter. You hold your finger up, depending <laughs> on. <laughs> I, I um, yeah. Um, I, I guesstimate a lot, and I my negatives. The printing out paper was, you couldn't have too thin a negative for yes. printing out paper, but it could. If it took three days to expose, you could get even the densest negative to print. Yes. Now it's a little trickier, and I do use, I try to use a light meter some of the time. But the truth is also that one can guess the amount of light pretty accurately if you train yourself. We just don't think of that, but it's like guessing how, you know, how much light is there. And if you really do that a lot, then mm -hmm. you get better and better at it. Uh, then Bachmir says, as you have aged and your work has evolved, do you find that your image evolution is natural and intuitive, or has it sometimes been as methodical a methodical desire for change? Hmm. I mean, no, I don't. Don't think I um, say, okay, it's a new year. I think I better take up something different. Um, there is the, the th there's something about publishing a book that can often lead to closure. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I wonder if there, this idea of closure and bodies of work is sometimes imposed on artists by a gallery or the museum or this idea that the artist reinvents himself yeah. or herself, I think a lot of artists just keep on going, that mm -hmm. things come out of previous work mm -hmm. and get changed and reworked and come up again and fused into other things. Mm -hmm. Often I'll be doing, you know, some kind of, well, I'll call it straighter photography. And then um, for a Christmas card or something, I'll get more playful or whimsical or I'll be doing uh, you know this sharp ape view camera work and then do a collage uh, work with a collage project. Yeah. 
Dave Wilson. I'm a beginner photographer who is fortunate enough to live near a lot of really beautiful nature. I have great subject matter at my disposal, but I feel like as a photographer I can't do justice yet. Do you have any advice for someone who can see the beauty of a shot in person, but has trouble translating it into photography? Well, don't beat yourself up. Um, enjoy being out there. Um, you might try some experiments, though. You might try going out at night, maybe with a strobe or a flashlight, and work where, you know, you're not, you're allowing, you're not sure what the hell is going to come out, and something might really surprise you. Um, you might do some photograms of some of the material that you find out um, when you're walking around. And, and I'd look at a lot of photographs by a bunch of different people and see if something triggers something in you, whether or not you want to work. If you're working in black and white, it's more abstract than working in color. But then again, you have to be able, and you, you learn somehow or other it sinks in. You can look at a whole scene in color and then be able to somehow in your mind see how that will be framed and how it might translate into black and white. Yeah. And I think that maybe, you know, when you say don't beat yourself up, what I might add to that is that don't think too much because sometimes, and especially in the digital realm now where you always or most people will look at their images right away, that's not a good thing. That's a disconnect. That's like editing. And editing is a very different process. That's a more intellectualized mental process. I think, I mean, it's different for each artist, but, you know, for most artists, the photographing part in the field is very intuitive. And I would say to uh, somebody like that, just just do it. Just let yourself be carried away, and then later, yeah, give you think up. about it a bit. And also, um, if you can have them translated, even if, let's say, you're doing digital work in color, take it to Costco or someplace and get little prints. Don't try to see everything on the screen. Make actual images. Yeah. I mean, sorry, actual prints. Yeah, they don't have to be good or, right. you know, whatever. Um, you want them for editing, and they're great for sequencing. Um, another thing that for, I realized uh, after teaching for a number of years that beginning students um, very often have a picture of a shadow of a tree on a wall and their girlfriend standing next to the shadow tree. Or they go someplace downtown and start seeing stuff in shop windows with the reflection and they've got something happening on the street and inside at the same time. And it occurred to me that when you're a child um, and very young, you have to learn that shadows are not a drop-off and that a reflection is a false space. And, or you try to walk through the mirror a couple of times and you, you learn. Um, so you, you, just need to sort of look and make it sort of picture in your head. <laughs> well, Linda, and you can use your hands too, to you know. You. Yeah. Well, Linda, thank you very, very <laughs> much welcome. for letting us come to your house and ask some questions and see your wonderful images. Thank you. And it's, it's great hearing from some of my dear friends. Great. Okay. Thank okay. you. You're welcome.